What's happening, fam? Good morning. What's up? <laughs> Good morning. Good. Is it morning? Oh, almost. We're still there. We're almost there. Nicely done. Hey, how about baptisms, huh? Did you guys enjoy that? Wow. What an honor it is and what a blessing it is. Hopefully you all enjoyed it as much as I do. I, I, as, as I was telling those who were baptized, I don't take it lightly. I'm truly honored um, that they would invite us into uh, not the body of Christ at Elevate Church, but also me to have the opportunity to do that. It is a blessing, and it's so cool that we get to do that. And we'll be doing them, I think, in October. So keep an eye out for those announcements because we're going to be doing baptisms again. And it's really interesting. Um, I had a conversation with one of the people that was baptized today. Uh, earlier this week, and they were a little bit hesitant and feeling some fear and trepidation, right? Which is natural when you're trying to go all in for God, yeah? And so I had this discussion with this person, uh, you know, just saying, oh, I might not be ready, and, and so on and so forth, excuses that the enemy tries to inject when you decide to go all in. Because guess what? He doesn't want us to go all in, because he knows what the result is going to be from that. And so, but of course, the Holy Spirit prevailed, and uh, that person went ahead and got baptized today. So I love that, and I love that's a, such a small testimony. But I know that the, the attack is real because the purpose is real in that person's life. The purpose is real in your life and in my life, and so we have to be prepared for that. So all in, it was an honor to watch all of those people go all in. Uh, pray for them and continue to uh, do fellowship with them and encourage them. And I encourage you, if you haven't been baptized yet, keep an eye out. I'm ready to dunk some more, y'all. Amen? <laughs> All right, so here we are in week three of this series, All In. Um, we've been talking about how to completely be committed to the cause of Christ in this broken world. And as many of you know, we've been uh, looking at a key verse from the Gospel of Matthew in Matthew 16, 24, throughout this series, where Jesus gives us kind of a three-step command to knowing and following him, right? Right? And we've journeyed through the first two things that he says, and, and now we land on the culmination of all three in this, in this third uh, command or third step to knowing and following him. And we're going to read through this in Matthew 16, 24. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, which is living and active which is truth, which washes, washes us clean, Lord God. Thank you that your word never returns void. Lord, I pray that you prepare our hearts to hear a word in season. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Lord, search us, know us. For anything that is not of you, any wicked way, Lord, we ask that you renew in us a steadfast spirit so we truly can pursue you and go all in. We declare less of us more of you, less of us, and all of you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? Amen. All right. So once we've taken the time to deny ourselves, and once we've been willing to pick up our cross and carry it, Jesus calls us to do what? To follow him. And today we're going to answer the question, what happens when we decide to truly follow Jesus? But first, we're going to talk about sports. Yeah? <laughs> I, I try to bring sports in. I'm, you know me. It's all good. Some of you may not be sports fans, but here we, I like to talk about sports. I'll try not to do it every Sunday. But anyway, as, as you all know, some of you know we are a basketball family. We love basketball. But I also really like football. Do we have any football fans in the house? Some, we have some football fans. All right, good, good. And so I grew up in Southern California, grew up kind of in the L.A. area. And we had the Raiders and the Rams, and then they left because they don't want to be in L.A., I get it. But anyway, um, and so I, I liked the Rams when I was a kid, but there wasn't really a professional team for a lot of the time. And I grew up in an Irish Catholic family. And so you have no other team to root for except for Notre Dame, right? Go Irish. Do we have any Irish fans in here? Okay, at least we got a couple. Good. There's my mom. Good. We've got a couple Irish fans, right? And she knows, my mom knows, her dad, my grandfather, would put the Notre Dame flag and the Irish flag on his house every Saturday during football season. And if you walked in front of the TV when he was watching that game, you are in big trouble, right? Like, it's your fault they lost the game. Anyone ever been there with someone? Right. And that's how diehard he was. And so I was, I was a, a diehard, and I still am. I love, I love the Irish, love watching college football. I don't get the opportunity to watch it as much. But, but when I was younger, I mean, I, I knew, by the way, Notre Dame destroyed Navy 42-7 to seven or something yesterday. 
in Ireland. And the cool thing is that we had some of our uh, Elevate Church family that just so happened to be on vacation in Europe and had tickets to the game and went to the game in Ireland. So what's up, Manny and Liz and Marilyn and Patrick? I bet you all enjoyed it. So I can't wait to hear the stories of it. So I don't know their schedule, but I knew they were playing in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I knew their schedule right when I was younger. I knew who the quarterback was, who the running back was, knew who the coach was, knew their wins and losses, and, and really followed the team. There was even a time when I got to um, go to a prayer breakfast. It's a Catholic school, if you don't know uh, Notre Dame. But a prayer breakfast the, the day before the game when they played SC, USC. And um, when I was, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, something like that. And that year, uh, Lou Holtz was still the coach. Rick Meyer was the quarterback. Jerome Bettis was the bowling ball. I mean, the running back. Um, that's his nickname, if you don't know. And I got to meet those guys and a couple others and get autographs. And I still have those autographs. And we'll go to the highest bidder if you want to. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm keeping those. But, but anyway, the point is, is I knew these players. I followed them. I thought that I knew. I kind of had this relationship with them. Another thing is, I'm from L.A. We love basketball. I was a Lakers fan my whole life. Kobe Bryant was born the same year that I, that I was born. And so I followed his whole career. It was almost like I knew him. I knew what high school he went to. I knew he was coming out and going in the draft. I became a fan of his uh, uh, immediately. And, and tragically, he lost his life um, in, in 2020. And that was tough, too, for all of us that knew him, right? We act like we know, we know these people, right? And my wife, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out. Diehard Miami Heat fan right there. Has she ever been? Have you been to Miami? Okay, so, but she's a diehard Miami Heat fan. And if you're a basketball fan, I would say that my wife could probably stand up against any basketball fan knowing NBA team stats, schedules, all the things. And the funny thing is she listens to podcasts and things like that, probably more of the basketball podcasts than I do. Her two favorite things besides the Lord and her family, right, <laughs> are, um, are, are worship music and NBA basketball. And so there's this podcast she listens to where these two worship leaders talk about basketball. So she's like, we got to listen to this. I'm like, all right. It's actually cool. You should check it out. What's it called? It's Josh and Mac do sports. Josh and Mac do sports. It's kind of good. It's kind of funny. Kind of the combo. But anyway, if, if you ask her about the Miami Heat, she knows who's on the team. She knows the coach. She knows the upper management. She knows their schedule throughout the, the year. She follows it, right? It's like she knows them. And maybe for some of you, it's not sports. Maybe it's like musicians, actors, celebrities, a, a, a great thinker in the world, right? You know a lot about them, but you don't really know them, even though you can probably recite stats and facts and you know a lot of information about them. Some of y'all know like birthdays and spouses and kids of celebrities. Y'all are going a little overboard on IMDb. But we know them, right? We know them. And, and there's a similar thing that takes place in our relationship with Jesus. It's called a relationship for a reason. We're not just supposed to know about him. We're meant to be as close to Jesus as possible, right? And how do we do this? We do this by following him and his direction into the world, right? And, and, it's, and it's sometimes what we do is we come to Christ. We have that salvation, which is the greatest gift. And then it's, we just hear the stories and we know about him. But do we really know him? Right? Is he, is he like a celebrity or an athlete or, or, or a professional sports team where you know them? Or, or are we in cro close relationship, close proximity to Jesus? And, and so we're going to talk about what happens when we decide to follow him completely. And it's worth noting that we all follow or take after someone or something in our lives, right? And it could be, it could be a parent, could be a sibling, could be an athlete, a musician, celebrity, whoever it is, someone that was around throughout our life that we watch and try to emulate ourselves after. It's that whole thing I talk about often is the caught over taught, right? As kids, as children, as younger folk, <laughs> we tend to catch more than we are taught, right? We catch that. We, 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 are, um, we try to emulate ourselves after the people in our life. And this is how we develop an identity, truly, right? And, and, and the truth is, when we trade our old life for new life in Christ, we also receive a new identity. He gives us a new identity. And so, so as you think about this truth, also think about where you identify yourself now. Like, who do you look up to and seek to model your life after now? Who is in your life? Maybe you have mentors. Maybe you don't. Maybe there's uh, a, an athlete, a professional, uh, 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 
singer or celebrity, whatever it may. Maybe, maybe you have mentors in the faith. Maybe you faithfully listen to a podcast in basketball and, and worship because you're going that direction. Whatever it may be, who do you look up to and seek to model your life after? There's probably many in our lives and maybe you have some now. And I want to tell you about one of when I was younger, <clears throat> a person who I emulated or wanted to be. And she's laughing because she knows the story. But my wife loves to tell the story about when she first discovered my CD collection when we were dating. And how many of you know that's like, that's like a, a trajectory of which way a relationship can go, <laughs> right? You're dating. You're the new relationship. I got to see the CD collection to know who you really are. So she opens up my CD collection in my car. And what do we have on the first page? Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, LFO. O-Town, right? Boy bands, that was it for me. Some of y'all don't know who that is, but boy bands, R&B, I was all about it. In particular, NSYNC. That was my era, NSYNC over Backstreet all day long, fam, all right? (laughs) And so much to the extent it was more, it was narrowed down Justin Timberlake. I wanted to be that guy. That was my guy, right? (laughs) <laughs> who doesn't, right? Senorita, I feel for you. Sorry, anyway. So, um, next that, I threw away my CD collection. Another story for another day. But anyway, so I was all about it. That was my deal. I wanted to be JT. I even had kind of curly hair, and I kind of made it a lot curlier so that I could look like him, right? I was trying to emulate. I was trying to be like him. I had the opportunity to meet him backstage at one of his concerts. I went to four NSYNC concerts. I hung out with Chris Kirkpatrick, who was with NSYNC as well. I had a lot of opportunity to be around these people because of my friends. And I was like, I got to be, I wanted to be him, right? That was who I was trying to identify with. I was creating that persona, right? And our, our, our identity can often be found in the things in the world just like that. Things that we spend and even invest tons of time in. And most of these things are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. However, when they become our identity, then they can be, right? And and there's a story in Scripture I want to talk about in Matthew 4. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 4, verses 18 through 20. And and in this story, Jesus is giving someone a new identity. This, This very thing happens whenever anyone, even today, any of us, decide to follow Jesus personally. The Holy Spirit comes within you and starts to reshape your priorities and your life as a whole for the better, right? But in the gospel accounts, we read of Jesus calling an initial 12 people to follow him. We know that to be the 12 disciples. And so here's a brief interaction with Jesus and Peter in Matthew 4, 18. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. That's important to know. Jesus called out to them, come. Follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Another uh, version says, I will make you fishers of men. And we could take this right here, these, three ver- these couple of verses, and we could preach an entire sermon on just these verses, right? But, but what I want us to see today in particular are two key verses. Something else to note, side note, it says, come follow me. And I will show you how to fish for people. And what does it say? And they left their nets at once and followed him. How many of you, let's be honest, the first time you felt that, that inkling, that gut feeling that you should follow Christ, that you should come into relationship with Jesus, Jesus, how many of you were like, yeah, I'm all in, let's go, right? Yeah, all right, we got a couple, we had a few, thank you for being honest. But I'm with you, that was not me either, right? I was, that was not that person who ran after Christ immediately. How cool that, that Peter and Andrew... It says right there, they left their nets and at once followed him. And first the Bible tells us what Peter and his brother Andrew were doing. They fished for a living. It says it straight up, right? It says they were fishermen. This is where they were when Jesus found them. Some of us can remember where we were when Jesus found us, right? When More like when we found him, right? Because he was always waiting. So this is where they were when Jesus found them. It was their trade, It was the thing that brought them a steady income, their families a steady income, and provided for their families. And and it would have been really easy for Jesus to take this moment to look at them in this and simply offer something better, right? Something that would have dismissed their desire and ability to fish and brought them into something completely new. But instead, Jesus says this, and it's really important to know, come follow me and I will show you how to fish 
for people. And now we, a lot of us have heard this story a lot. I'll make you fishers of men, all that. It's like, yeah, yeah, I've heard the story. I know about it. But it's important to note that, that Jesus sees what they're doing. They have this, maybe they have a passion and a desire to do an occupation that wasn't looked at as, as this hierarchy, this amazing occupation as a fisherman. But he took that and he's like, okay, you fish for fish now. But follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you fish for people. So they still have that ability. He's using what is in them for his purpose, for the building of the kingdom. Amen? And if you read in the book of Acts, if you continue on, you read about incredible things that Peter did, and he eventually does for the kingdom of heaven here on earth. He preaches the gospel, and thousands get saved, right? He prays for people, and those people get healed. And this is the same man, Peter, that one day Jesus would say he would build his church on, on the very revelation, Peter's revelation, that Jesus is the Son of God. So he took that revelation, that fact, and built the church on that. And because of that, we see a shift in Peter's life, right? Um, I believe that that shift can happen in our life as well. That same shift that happened in Peter's life. And what was that? When Jesus finds Peter, he is Peter, the fisherman, who in that moment decided to follow Jesus. But then as, the, as time goes on, when Peter nears his death here on earth, he becomes, his identity is, he becomes known as Peter, the follower of Jesus, who also happens to fish. Do you see how that shift happened in his life, right? Family of God, church, please hear me on this. Jesus does not want to remove your passion and replace it with something different. There, that, that is put in you for purpose, for call, for building of the kingdom. Sometimes we think when we come to Christ, yes, we need to get rid of the worldly things. But there's a passion and a purpose that he has already put in us from the beginning that he will use when we go all in. Amen? Amen. So, so what if Jesus wants to use what you already do? What if, what if he use, wants to use what you're already good at? What if he wants to use that for a higher purpose to change the world? Sometimes we, we come to church and we're talking about purpose and call, which was our last series a couple weeks ago, and we're like, yes, I'm called and I'm stepping in this purpose, and we feel like it has to be ministry just because that's how we talk about it. Well, your ministry could be the marketplace. If you're a business owner, that's your ministry, bro. You're, you're discipling people, and I know that, that Eddie is an amazing discipler. He is a, he is a leader to his crew, right? And I know that God is going to use him for greater things in that. And it could be even more, Pastor. <laughs> but, but it doesn't always have to be ministry. There's marketplace ministry. Our ministry is wherever we are. St. George, Utah, southern Utah, it's our ministry. Family of God, we raised our hands last, last week. And, and very few of us are from St. George. I'm not saying the people from St. George are not called to the city. Amen, Annalisa, right? You're called to the city too with purpose. But we're here for a purpose. Our ministry is everywhere we go. Amen. I'm getting off on a tangent. Anyway, so um, what, if, what if Jesus wants to use what we already have, what we already do? And that's what it feels like and sounds like to have Jesus give us a brand new identity in him. But even with this newfound identity, what happens? We sometimes fall short, right? Sometimes fall short. And there's a popular misconception that when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he took away the presence of sin in the world, right? You get that for people that see you going all in, they're like, oh, well, what's all the sin in the world then if Jesus really exists? Right? There's that popular misconception. But what actually happened is Jesus paid the penalty for sin in our own lives. What does that mean? It means that whoever comes to follow him would not have to spend eternity separated from God. And that's a big statement. Think about being separated from, from God. And now what happens, we can spend eternity with him in heaven while having our lives changed and molded into the image of Christ each day here on earth, right? So, so we sometimes mess up here on earth, and this is the story of Peter as well. If you know the story of Peter and how many times he screwed up, and went against God, and, oh, man, I wish I could remember exactly the verse. It's coming in here, but it hasn't quite processed to the front yet. I'll tell you if I get there. Anyway, but, um, but, but Jesus basically has to rebuke Peter because of his mistakes, right? And so, so Peter's story is an interesting one. Some of us might relate, right? And, and there's, this, there's this profound scene between Peter and Jesus uh, when Jesus nears his death on earth. And it's interesting because, again, the, the story of Peter, uh, the good news is that when we follow Jesus, he makes all of our wrongs 
right in the eyes of God. When, when we mess up and, and we beat ourselves pro- up probably more than anything, I am, I am guilty of doing that. But the beautiful thing is in salvation in Jesus Christ is that the Father looks down upon us through salvation in Christ Jesus when we repent and we come to him. And he doesn't see us in our sin. He doesn't see us in our mistakes that we see. What does he see? He sees Jesus. He sees us through that blood covenant. What a beautiful truth and that is. And so, so here we have this moment in John 13, uh, 37 and 38 between Peter and Jesus. And, and Peter makes this bold claim. And he says, and it says here, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? He's like, I want to follow you now. Like, I'm all in. I'm ready to do this. He says, I will lay down my life for your sake. Peter's being bold. He's ready to go all in. But this claim from Peter is followed up with this, this really cool prophetic word from Jesus. And check this out. He says, Jesus answered him and says, I feel like he likes to say it. He said it like this. You ever do that when you read the Bible? Kind of like you try to put the, the punctuation where you think it's going to be. Right? I feel like Jesus said it like this. Will you lay down your life for my sake? He's like, for real? You really? Will you really? And then he follows it up. Most assuredly, I say to you, the, roast, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. He's like, I know what's going to happen, Peter. I know you're not going to lay down your life, at least in, in this moment. So, so picture this scene. Peter's feeling really confident, right? And he probably doesn't even believe Jesus' words to him in this response. But, but soon enough, the words of Jesus would come to pass. And later we deny, I'm sorry, we deny. Later we read of Peter denying that he has never met Jesus three different times. Many of us have probably heard this story. And, and we're like, Peter, why would you deny him? I wouldn't do that. Come on. Let's be real. Why did he deny him? Because Jesus just got arrested. He knows what's going to be happening in his life. And I think many of us, in the, given that situation, be like, yeah, I don't know who that guy is. I'm out, right? Rightfully so. I mean, that's his flesh ruling him in that situation, right? He might have been thinking, would the same thing happen to me if I say that I associate with this Jesus? Who knows? We might be coming to that time in this world. Will something bad happen to me? Will something different happen to me if I say, yeah, I am associated with Jesus Christ? We see that in other parts of the world, but it may be coming. We never know. Nevertheless, (laughs) for Peter, it doesn't end there. And and praise the Lord that mo- moments we fall short, like Peter did, are not the full story, right? It doesn't have to be the way the story ends. And, and for Peter, it didn't end there. Um, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, we read this in John. We're going to be in John 21 as we read through this. And I want you to really, really lean into this. It's a cool revelation here. So John 21, 15 through 17. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He's like, come on, man, you know that. You know that I love you, he said to him. So Jesus said, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Peter was was probably irritated too, right? He's grieved because he said to him the third time. He said it three times. He's like, come on, man. So Jesus says, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. He's like, you already know this. You know everything. You know that I love him. So Jesus said again to him, feed my sheep. Watch this. Three times. Peter denies that he knows Jesus. And three times, Jesus makes the wrong right by asking Peter if he loves him. Each time, not only does Peter declare that he loves Jesus, but in response, Jesus gives Peter calling after calling after calling. Purpose after purpose after purpose every time in that, right? It's almost as if Peter had had rededicated his life to follow Jesus. He will always turn what the enemy meant for bad around for the good of those that love him. You know that verse? Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And then he turned that around and he erased that denial that Peter had three times. 
It's a beautiful thing. And God will do that for you and me in every situation. And we'll, we'll never be able to add up the math, but I promise you, when it comes, times to go and be, comes, comes time to go and be with the Lord, he has erased all of that that we think we still have to carry with us. He has erased it every step of the way. So do you love him? Yeah. Amen. Feed his sheep. Amen. Amen. It's not just my job. It's not just my wife's job. It's all of our jobs, right, as ministers of the gospel to feed the sheep. When I, when I finally fell to my knees and gave it all to Jesus, it, it was after a series of failures throughout my 20s, right? There was, in my teen years, I was raised Catholic. I was very involved in, in uh, the youth ministry there and the summer camp and things. And there was, there was a lot of times where I felt a pull to dig deeper. And I didn't know much about the Bible, didn't know much about the Word, just, you know, just listening, half listening to it, to be honest, in church, um, for all you half listeners, uh, but um, no, but growing up, you know, I didn't know a lot about it, but I really felt this pull to dig deeper often, and I would talk to God on my own, um, and I honestly even felt called to ministry, but I didn't know what that looked like, I didn't know how to decipher what that looked like, and then End of my teen years, into my 20s, I ran for the world, and I followed all worldly things. And I was on fire for the world doing my own thing. I followed the world and everything that I did. And I came to this point where uh, I had some success in restaurant operations and management and then wanted to go into real estate and failed in that also. So I'm back to bartending. A lot of you know the story. And I responded to multiple invites to church by a friend of mine. I was thinking about this. I'm like, what if it was three times? That would be really cool. Hey, come to church. Hey, come to church. Hey, come to church. So I responded to multiple invites to church by a friend of mine, and that resulted in my redemption story, Back to the Father. In order to hear that story, you have to come to Welcome Home after this service. No, I'm just kidding. But, but it's a beautiful story of redemption that, 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 that God wrote that story in my life, and I'm so honored that he called me into relationship with him. And so, family of God, here's what I believe to be true. The God of the universe is not in heaven waiting there with his arms crossed, just angrily waiting for his people to turn toward him. I don't picture God like that, right? I believe he's waiting kind of like an eager child on Christmas, right? You all know that, right? Christmas is here. I'm ready. To, I will never wake up as a kid at 6 a.m., but darn right I'll be up at 5 a.m. on Christmas morning because I'm eager to open that gift or even better, like an eager father who got the most epic gift for your kid. Any dads in here that have gotten the most epic gift for your kids and you want to sit there leaning forward waiting for them to open up that gift because you know they're going to light up because it's exactly what they asked for. And you didn't even give that clown Santa Claus credit. You put your name. This is from, <laughs> this is from dad, right? This epic gift is from dad. <laughs> so I like, to picture, I like to picture God like that, right? That he's leaning forward, looking, putting the opportunity, and when his children unwrap the free gift of salvation, the greatest gift ever, he's like shouting for joy in heaven, right? And, and the Bible even says that there is a party in heaven when people come to Christ, that the angels rejoice, right? And when we decide to turn and face him, we realize at some point that he makes us whole again. He has redeemed us from sin and death, and we need to be reminded of this sometimes, that he makes us whole. Sometimes I, look, sometimes I look at other people's situation, other people that aren't believers, some friends of ours or whatever, and they're going through a difficult situation. And I just kind of want to say, y'all need Jesus, right? <laughs> you, got any, you got any people that you know, like, y'all need Jesus, right? Like, I, how do you do this life without Jesus? I just can't fathom it, right? You look at your friends. But then, but then, I, then I look inward, right? I'm like, where would I be without Jesus, like how in the world, you ever look back and do that? And now to be honest, I don't really want to know the answer to that question. I don't want to know with some of the things I've been through in my life the answer to that question. But because there came a point in my life where I realized that the things I was chasing after and even following after instead of Jesus were not fulfilling me like I thought that they would. Like the world tells you that they will. You know, there's this term or, or this saying, some of you might have heard it, that there's a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And we often try to fill that hole with the things that are not God and instead come from the material world. We try to fill that hole with worldly things, be it career, be it relationship, be it status, whatever it may be. We try to fill that with material world things. And, and, and none of those things are ever going to satisfy us for eternity, right? 
And that's why following Jesus Christ is the only thing that can truly make us whole, to fill that God-shaped hole. And here's what Paul has to say about this in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and make your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God desires to sanctify us or, or to make us holy in every possible way. What does that mean in layman terms? Basically, when we decide to follow Jesus, God will seep into every area of our lives to make us whole. This is the only way we can truly live life the best way possible, even here on earth. I say this all the time, Jesus, we talked about that free gift, it's an epic gift, right? It's a beautiful thing. Salvation in Jesus Christ, it's a beautiful thing. And sometimes as Christians, we stop there. It's like, oh, and then we just kind of know about Jesus instead of really knowing him, right? And the beautiful thing is, is that when we go all in, when we really truly decide to follow him, he will go to every dark area and illuminate it for the sake of healing, not for shame. The world, sometimes religions, want us to live in that shame for control. But that's not what Jesus is doing. Again, he will go to every dark area and illuminate it for the sake of healing rather than shame. He will heal that God-shaped hole. He will visit every hidden thing and bring it to the surface as you go all in. Essentially, he will go all in for us as we go all in for him. Amen. And that's hard to do. I'm, 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 I'll tell you what, it's hard to do. I understand. I'm with you. It's hard to go all in because we, we, we want to hold on like Pastor Stan talked about, right? We hold on to that thing. But the Lord wants us to live life like this because it will continue to put in and give us opportunity to put it out. And if we, but we hold, I love, your, I love your, your analogy. Where's Pastor Stan? Where are you? I love the analogy of the monkey thing because they would reach into that jar and grab hold of it and never let go. So they're stuck and now they're trapped. And we're the same way. Career, but I'm making so much money. But I know that to go all in means to leave this. I'm not telling you to quit your job, all right? Don't get me wrong. But I don't know. Maybe you're in an industry that is unethical, and the Lord's been telling you that over and over and over. And you're afraid to leave the comfort of financial independence, right? But how many of us know that in Christ, the increase is even better? He will provide, like my wife said, People have walked up to us and said, here's a check not knowing we couldn't even make rent that month. I can't make that story up. But when you go all in for Jesus, that's the kind of things that happen. And I don't want to just sit in finances, right? I'm talking about restoration of family, believing God for the healing that you need in your life or the, or, or the healing that your family member or your friend. So many areas of the gospel of when you, when you go all in to build the kingdom, God is so faithful to be all in for you as well, family of God. Amen. Amen. Worship team, you guys can make your way up here. Family, he wants all of us, not just some of us. Not just part of our lives, not just the peace of our heart, right, that we feel comfortable giving away. There's always that, yeah, I'll give this little bit over here to Jesus, but I'm going to stay here. But some of you all know the verse, what does it say to be lukewarm? What happens? He will spew you out of, out of, our, out of his mouth. That's... That's a revelation. Maybe you haven't gotten there yet. So anyway, right, he wants all of us, not just part of our lives, not just that piece of the heart. He wants it all. And that's why we call it going all in for Jesus. Because if we leave part of our life out, then our priorities will be divided. Our understanding of lordship will be divided, right? We got we to gotta be people completely surrendered to Jesus Christ and willing to follow him no matter what. Through every trial. Every circumstance that comes our way. As we identify with Christ and recognize that we have been truly forgiven, we are able to give ourselves more fully to him. Over time, we learn to trust him. Our faith grows. And eventually, we see his faithfulness in all areas of our life. And that inspires us to follow him even further. But you got to take that faith step. you got to take that faith walk, right? We walk by faith and not by sight. That's a hard thing to do sometimes. But that's what it means to go all in. It's not, let me clean up to come up, right? It's not, let me get my ducks in a row, and then I'll go all in, Lord. No, it's like, I'll go all in and watch what he'll do for you. 
You're never going to get your ducks in a row. I tried to get my ducks in a row before I got married. The Lord said, uh-uh, put a ring on it. <laughs> right? Maybe some of y'all been there. No, when the Lord's prompting you to do something, go all in. I promise you, he is faithful to carry you through every step of the way, family of God. Selfishly, I want you to go all in. Because I want to see you walk out your purpose and your call. On this, I would want to see every single one of you. You are called with a purpose. You are called to southern Utah. You are called to where you live. You are called to where you job. As much as your job might suck right now for some of you, you are there for a purpose. I've been there mopping floors late at night by myself. I'm here to plant a church. What the heck's going on, Lord? Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Tend to my sheep. You, each and every one of you have a call. And again, I'll say it again. I separately want to see every single one of you walk that call out. It fills me up. And I know you want to see the same for your family, for your friends, right? See them walking out that purpose. Wow. Imagine what southern Utah would look like if we all went all in. And if you're sitting here today and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I've been in church, in and out of church. I don't have this relationship. I don't talk to God right. Or maybe you've never fully committed your life to Christ. And if you've never gone all in on the journey, I encourage you to consider giving yourself over to his ways, right? His plan for your life today. Deny yourself, family of God. Pick up your cross and follow him. He is faithful to carry you through that. When you come to Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that's the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. You ever need comfort? In Christ, in all, all in, you got it. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. You ever need counsel? In Christ, when you're all in, you got that. Holy Spirit is our advocate. Do you ever need someone to advocate for your situation? Heck yeah, man. Right? In Christ, when you're all in, you have that. I encourage you guys to go all in today. And so we're going to do something um, right now. You guys go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going to sing this song again together as a family of God. And we're going to say, I will follow, right? But before we do that, I want to say a prayer. Many of you know we, we do this every, every week. As a reminder of the time when we said, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm going all in. I'm professing faith in Jesus Christ. I'm turning away from that old life. I'm turning for what you have for us, for me. How many of you know that the creator of heaven and earth probably has a better plan for you than you do? Amen? Right? So we're going to say this prayer together, but I want to do two things. Number one, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to say this prayer with us together as a family. Also, maybe you've been walking away, maybe you walked away from the Lord. Maybe you've said a prayer of salvation and you've been saved and you're at a time in your life where you're kicking and screaming and flailing and trying to go against the purpose of God, but you feel him pulling you in and you're like, you know what, I better rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. That might be you in here today. I encourage you, the Holy Spirit's tugging on you. Let's go all in. So let's do this. Family of God, if you would close your eyes for me. All of us close our eyes. And if that's you, if you've never professed faith in Jesus Christ and, and you've never said a prayer to make that start, to turn away from your old life, to turn towards him, and you want to do that today. You said, I want new life in Christ Jesus. If that's you, I would, I would ask you to raise your hand. Just go ahead. Every eye closed. Anyone, just raise your hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and profess faith in Jesus Christ. Good, I see those hands. Beautiful. Go ahead and put your hand down. And now those of you that have a relationship with Christ, if you feel the Lord pulling you in deeper, and you want to take this moment to rededicate your life to Christ, to say, here's my line in the sand. I know I did it then, but Lord, I really feel and I got to go all in. Like those people that got baptized today, I'm ready to go all in. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ, every eye closed, let's go ahead. And if you want to rededicate, go ahead and raise your hand. Raise your hand. You're all in. You're saying, Lord, that's me right here. Look, you see me, Lord. I am all in. I see all those hands. Amen. Go ahead and put your hands down. Holy Spirit, thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray for all of us first, and then we'll say a prayer together. Holy Spirit, thank you for moving 
hearts toward the Father. Father in heaven, thank you for your purpose and your plan to reconcile us back to you. Wow, what an honor to be in relationship with the creator of the universe. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for each person that raised their hand and rededicated and each person that raised their hand and said, I want new life in Christ. Holy Spirit, I pray that you flood them right now in the name of Jesus. Do you flood their hearts with your love, with your light, with your comfort, your counsel, all at once, Lord. Flood them with the power of the Holy Spirit as they have professed faith in you. I pray for each person that raised their hand to rededicate, that you would open doors, that you would give them clarity and vision for purpose in their life. They can walk out that call hand in hand with you, not just knowing about you, not just knowing some stories, but truly knowing you in an intimate relationship. Lord, would you... Would you give them that opportunity? Flood their hearts. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives. Family of God, let's say this together. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead and that you are seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Thank you for not giving up on me. I give my life to you. Use me to build your kingdom. Today I'm all in. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, family.